Now, we've talked about the first thing they're going to look at is a person's credit score. The second thing they would look at is a person's debt to income. The third thing, not in your book, but I always write this in so it helps you for later. The third thing the lender is going to look at is the house itself. How does a lender know that the asset that the person is pledging as collateral is worth the loan they're asking to borrow? How does the bank know the house is worth $100,000? They go off the, uh, mm, I had it. The appraisal? The appraisal, yeah, the appraisal. <laughs> I had it. <laughs> think about this. That's exactly what an appraisal is. An appraisal is a educated person who is hired by the bank because the bank is sitting in Texas and they're loaning money to Raymond in Nashville, Indiana, they have no idea. So they call an appraiser in Nashville and go, hey dude, is that house worth a hundred grand? Because Raymond's asking us to loan him a hundred thousand. So they hire an appraisal. That's what the appraisal is. It is nothing more than verifying the value of that asset so that the lender knows I've got collateral to loan this money out. All right. So that's the third thing that they're going to look at is the house. Now, when they do that, one of the other concepts that they use is this thing called loan to value. Loan over the value of the house. This is a common thing, and you would hear, hear the slang called LTV. And what they really like, their favorite number in the whole wide world, is 80% loan to the value of the house. All right? So if they loan the person $80,000 and they have it appraised and the appraiser says it's worth 100, they in fact now have an 80% loan to value. That is the key metric that all lenders use. The number one thing they look at is what's the loan to value. In a situation of 80% loan to value, how much equity does the borrower have? 20 grand. 20% in this particular case, it's 20,000. You could do the same thing. If the house is 200 grand, they got 20%, which is $40,000. They borrow 80%, which is 160. So that is the lender's key metric is loan to value. You will see that the rest of your career. Every time you talk to a lender, they're going to talk to you about, well, what's the loan to value? Your client, what's their loan to value? Well, they're looking at a $100,000 house. They've got twenty five grand in the bank. Great. We can get them an 80% loan to value because they need to bring 20% down payment. All right? Thumbs up. Now, that 20% that is also called equity, or a lot of times you will hear it called the down payment. I have to bring the down payment, all right? So if someone has a 100% loan to value, how much equity do they have? Zero, right? 100% loan to value, means there's zero equity. We used to have 100% loan to value. We are starting to go back to that because I think the lenders of the world are blinded by what happened 10 years ago in 2009, and they're kind of greedy. They want to make these loans, all right? So 
80 percent is the favorite number now the other thing that is very important to understand is this word here uh this word here value because value means one of two things value is the appraised value or the purchase price whichever is the listen to what i'm telling you whichever is the lower of the two numbers all right so if you agree to buy a house at a hundred thousand and the bank says we'll loan you 80 percent of the value that would be eighty thousand dollars right so they send an appraiser out and the appraiser comes back and says the value of that house is only 90 grand the bank says okay we will now loan you 80 percent of the ninety thousand dollar value or that translates to seventy two thousand dollar loan even though you guys agreed to buy it for a hundred the bank's value is the purchase price or the appraised value whichever is the lower of the two all right that protects the bank the most so keep that in mind when you're doing some homework Price value or the purchase price whichever is lower now the opposite certainly true you want to buy a house for 100 the appraiser comes back and says hey this house is worth 110 the bank is still only going to loan you 80 percent of the 100 that you agreed to buy it on because it's the lower of those two numbers on page 210 we're going to talk a little bit more about how this system works all right now i am actually missing my visual aids today uh so this let's see if we can get this there is this document called a note which the best way to look at it is an IOU. It is called a promissory note or a promissory vehicle or a financing vehicle or whatever you want to call it. This is the first document that the borrower of the money is going to sign. And it promises to repay every month $550 um they borrowed a hundred i'm doing this from memory five hundred and fifty dollars for 30 years that's a common note at 5.33 percent interest when they get done paying that mortgage off guess how much they actually pay back total two hundred thousand that's why I picked 5.33 because it doubles the money. So this person's borrowing a hundred grand, but over the course of 30 years, they're going to pay back 20,000 or $200,000. That increase is due to this thing right here called an interest rate, an interest rate. This note, will have the interest rate on it and that interest think of the interest as the amount of money that you pay to borrow someone else's money that's all interest is i need to borrow your money i'm going to pay you money for allowing me to borrow your money so the lender gives me a hundred grand and then I promise in this IOU to pay them back every month for 30 years. And by the time I get done paying them back, 
I will pay back a total of $200,000, right? All because of interest. I borrowed their money and now I've got to pay rent on their money. There is a law called the usury law, which allows or doesn't allow a person to charge too much interest. In the real world, we call this loan sharking. All right. <clears throat> there is a limited number that that person can pay. And in Indiana, I believe uh, the usury law is like 31%. All right, so they can only charge a certain, up to a certain number, and that number depends on whatever state is issuing you the credit. So if you look at like one of your true credit cards, it probably comes out of Connecticut, New Hampshire, Montana, because those states do not have a cap on their usury law. In theory, they could charge you 90% interest on your Visa card. And since even though you're sitting in Indiana, they are in Connecticut, that's where the credit is extended from. So they would follow that state's usury law. And there are about four or five states that don't have one. Connecticut, New Hampshire, Montana, Delaware, that's why you will see a lot of your credit cards issued out of Connecticut because they do not have that usury law. All right, are we good? Thumbs up? Let's talk about some other things here. Now, we have been kicking around this term and we use this term called a bank. Let's crush your fears or your theories right here. Banks do not have money, all right? Banks do not have money. The bank's investors have money, but the bank does not. You guys may be too young for this. You remember Beverly Hillbillies? You remember the premise behind the Beverly Hillbillies? This hillbilly lived out in the woods and all of a sudden he became rich. So he moved to Hollywood. And then there was this character named Mr. Drysdale. And Mr. Drysdale was the president of the bank. And in every episode, it was basically about Mr. Drysdale sucking up to Jed Clampett. Why was that? It's a true story insofar as because he had all the money. Because yeah. Clampett had the money, not the bank. Clampett put his money in the bank, and that's what allowed the bank to loan you that $100,000. The bank is an educated person that understands how to assess risk, but they don't have money. They use an investor's money. They used Jed Clampett's money. So banks don't have money. 